This worship service is a very special time. As we sing together and pray together, we realize that we've come together in an assembly from the past week to come upon the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, in a very special way from all of our backgrounds, from all of our happenings last week, our concerns, our problems, blessings, to worship together. And as we do that, it's a very special time especially when there are those with us who have been experiencing some difficult times and difficult health issues, able to be here back today, and so we're very thankful for that. The Gospel sermon this morning is affirming that Christ is ours. A first reaction may be, can we say that? (laughs) Is that true? Is that scriptural? What I intend for this sermon is for it to be a companion to last week's. Remember last Sunday morning we addressed the subject of to live as Christ. And Paul taught us what it means for each of us to make our life Christ. Today, Christ is ours. That may seem a little bit outrageous, outlandish, crossing the line or whatever, and we may even question the thought of that. Is that true, as I said at the beginning? You might even think, Wouldn't it be better to say, we are Christ? If we said that, that would certainly be correct. That's right, and that would be a good way to think. We are his. But our point right now is he is ours. And that's a good way to think too. And so what is it that makes this a scripture. What is the scriptural basis of this? Well, I'm suggesting this morning as we turn our attention to scripture that the basis of this concept, a lot of places, but it's concentrated, as Paul writes to Timothy and Titus. So in First and Second Timothy, as you and I read those epistles, as well as Titus, we read of statements where the Apostle Paul is affirming that Christ is ours, Timothy. You need to know that, you need to teach that, you need to preach that. A number of times the Apostle Paul says, Christ is our, and he completes that, and we will in just a moment. But I want to add another thought to this subject, to this theme, and that is this will become very personal and most meaningful and most beneficial when you are able to say, Christ is mine. As a group, as a collectivity, as a church, Christ is ours. But when it comes down to what really matters for you and your journey to heaven, you must be able to say, Christ is mine. He is mine. To be able to say that truly, accurately, honestly, sincerely. So everything we say in the next few minutes is going to be said to help us all with that concept. So as we turn our attention to 1 Timothy chapter 1, even the very first verse, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and Christ Jesus, who is our hope. So as Paul begins, there are some very important things in that very first verse. Sometimes we just kind of stem over, skip over, the salutations. But we realize that in this very first verse, the Apostle Paul is expressing, hey, 
This is who I am. I'm an apostle of Christ. I'm an apostle by the commandment of God and by the commandment of Jesus Christ. I am a genuine apostle. And no one is ever going to question or minimize that. But our point, in making this statement, the Apostle Paul identifies Christ is our. Christ is ours, Timothy. Christ is ours, Christians. Christ is our hope. Now when you think about, wait a minute, we're talking about a person, a very special person. But what Paul is intending, as we normally understand about this, that everything about your hope as a Christian, your Christian hope is personified. Everything involved is personified in him. You name it, it's in him. <laughs> and our hope for what is future to us, everything that we hope for as Christians, will be brought to reality by none other than him. He is our hope, our hope. And I trust that each of us can say, as I said at the beginning, Christ is my hope. We need to be able to say that on a very personal level, that Christ is mine. Christ is my hope hope. I experience that every day. I experience that in a very personal way, on a very personal level, and I never, never let go of that. Even in the very next verse, verse 2 to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. So you notice in the very next verse, he identifies Christ as ours, but as something different yet that is also important to all of us. And it becomes very clear as the salutation that Timothy is truly his spiritual son in the fact he converted Timothy on his missionary journeys. Lystra. But what he said in this passage is about Christ. Christ is ours because Christ is our Lord. Sometimes we kind of use that term lightly. I suggest sometimes I think I hear it as kind of a nickname or a name that we would name anything, uh, maybe even a pet. Lord, when really it is a term of position, it's a term of relationship in a very official and important way. It comes from a term in the original New Testament language that identifies one who has power and authority over others. So when you identify and when we identify Christ as ours, our Lord, we are identifying him as one who has power and authority over us. When you identify Christ as yours and your Lord, you are identifying him as having that relationship to you in that official almighty position of having power and authority over you. And this is fully realized. The significance and importance when we say Christ is my Lord. It's not just a name I use loosely. Uh, some, uh, uh, I find myself, perhaps you do, and perhaps we share in this, referring instead of using his official names, of Jesus or of Christ, I talk about my relationship to him as with the Lord. That has come in very common to me. But in doing that, I have to be careful, as you do, not to let it become too mundane or too common, as if talk about him as Lord, talk about something else with a common name. 
because it is a very special term that means I have submitted my will to his will. I have submitted my will, put myself into subjection to his authority and to his power over me. Now that's a very special way of thinking. We are not accustomed to thinking it like that in our American culture. We're not in subjection. We don't bow to anything. <laughs> but when it comes to our relationship with God and the relationship with Jesus, he is our Lord. We have submitted ourselves to him. There's a couple of things that I want us to identify about this that make it prominent in the New Testament scriptures. The Apostle Peter, when preaching that first gospel sermon in Acts 2, he convicted those Jews that were in his audience of crucifying Jesus, who was the Christ. And when he comes to verse 36, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And let me tell you, when they heard that, it was like a bolt of lightning. The Apostle Peter tells us that affected them so strikingly that they were pricked in the heart. And they said, oh, what shall we do? And that's when the Apostle Peter told them what to do to be saved in verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But our point is, God made him your Lord. In Acts 10, 36, the same Apostle, the Apostle Peter is now opening the doors to the kingdom to the Gentiles. This is in the house of Cornelius. You remember the things that brought them together. But the Apostle Peter has preached several important things that are now his new recognition about God and about God's attitude toward mankind. I, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is acceptable to him. The word which he sent unto the children of Israel, preaching good tidings of peace by Jesus Christ. And then it's parenthetical. And that, and that must indicate to us in the original language, the translators identify this as kind of an inserted side thought of the apostle Peter. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he discerned it important enough at this point to say, he is Lord of all. Not just a few, not just a part, but everyone. There is no division in the religious world where we have many or multiple lords. There is one Lord, one faith. So the Apostle Peter preached this as he is Lord over all in Acts the 10th chapter, the very first day that Gentiles were converted and entered into the kingdom. But then to come to the same Apostle in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, but sanctify in your hearts Christ as Lord. Be ready always to give answer to everyone that asketh you a reason concerning the hope that is in you. What is that, Peter? I'm talking to you. I'm giving you a mandated command. And what you are to do with him as Lord is to take him and sanctify him. That means set him apart in your heart as Lord. And that is above and beyond everything else. Put him on that throne where the most important reigns in your life. So Christ is ours. He's not a toy. He's not an incidental. He's not a pet. He is Lord. He is our Lord. 
and I trust that you can say, he is my Lord. In John 13, washing the feet of the apostles, he made this statement. There are a lot of things there in this chapter. But he said to them, you call me teacher and Lord. You say, well, you say, right. Why? Because so I am. That's what I am to you. If he had the opportunity to say that to you, this is what he would say. You call me Lord and you say very well because that's what I am. Personal response to you. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 12, Paul continues his thought here in the first chapter. He said, I thank him that enabled me, even Christ Jesus our Lord, for that he counted me faithful and appointed me to his service. You see, we have emphasized a word in that verse where he's telling Timothy, Jesus is ours, Timothy. He is mine, Timothy, because I thank him that enabled me. Christ is ours because Christ is our enabler. Now that may be worded differently in different translations, but that may be so, but here's what's important. The original word inspired by the Holy Spirit is a word that simply means one who clothes or furnishes. Christ is ours. In what sense? In the sense that he is one who clothes me and furnishes me. Now we know right off that's not physical in nature. He doesn't do that physically. He does that spiritually. And this word used in this way in our New Testament scriptures is a word that generally is referring to ability and strength. So I would say to you, if you are capable of service to Christ, if you're doing that which he wants you to do, if you're trying your best to be faithful, servant to him, a faithful disciple, I would suggest to you that you have been enabled. In Dunamo, that's what he is to you. That's how he is yours. That's how he is ours. Because he clothes us with ability and power and strength. I have a, a, a point of interest. This was highly interesting to me as I brought these thoughts together. Going back to the book of Acts in the ninth chapter, Bible students know this is where we read the history of the conversion of Paul, Saul of Tarsus. And Luke is writing this history. And in chapter nine, verse 22, Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews. The Jews that dwelt in Damascus, where he was, proving that this is the Christ. Okay, what is the relationship here? What is the harmony in Scripture here? What is the point here that can build our faith in the inspiration of Scripture and to realize more firmly that Jesus is ours? Because Luke, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, used that word in this passage. That's the word that he penned. And that's not by accident. He just simply recording the history of what actually happened to Saul of Tarsus to convert him into and bring him to the point where he was the great apostle Paul. He was enabled. What was happening here? The Lord was clothing him. The Lord was giving him the ability, giving him the strength to serve him. And my point here is, he won't make us apostles. That's already been in place. But he will make you 
a better Christian. He will make you a better servant by enabling you. Christ is ours in that he clothes us with ability and strength, enabling us. In chapter 2, verse 5, Paul continues with references to Jesus, and he makes some rather familiar statements. For there is one God and one mediator, also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So again, a lot of things in this verse. Our point of interest when we're discussing what Paul is saying to Timothy to teach us the principle that Christ is ours. He's, he's, he's mine because he is our mediator. We know that. But let's take the opportunity to think a little more deeply, seriously about that. And that is helped by looking at the word mediator and realizing that is a term mesites, which literally identifies a person in the middle. When you look at that, just that little word meaning so much, that prefix M-E-S, middle. If you take two points, the mediator, mediator, ship is in the middle. And this is what the Apostle Paul says about the Lord. We have one. There's not a plurality of mediators. There's only one mediator. Christ is ours. He is our person who stands between us and God. When you think about between you and God, there is a, let's call it for now, a middle point. A point between you and God. Somebody has to be there. God's not going to listen to you on your own. You don't have the qualities. You don't have the qualification on your own. From your own nature. To have the opportunity for God even to listen to you. But if there's someone in the middle. Then God hears you through him. And so therefore we understand the importance of this because what he is in that position between you and God, he acts to guarantee what otherwise would never happen. Without him, it would never happen. Without him, there would be no communication. He makes it happen and guarantees it. He is ours because he is our mediator. I have some other things that will help us expand our thinking on this concept in New Testament scriptures. All of us could think of different ways. Well, you think, okay, how is that so? Well, let me suggest to you that he himself had reference to this in John 14, 6, when he made that familiar statement, when he used the personal pronoun, I, I am, <laughs> I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. But here's a point that he says about all three of those. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. So here he picks his mediatorship as the way. Hodos, the roadway, the way that people have to travel to get there. I am that go-between. I am that path. I am that highway. I am that way. I make it possible for people to get to God. But also at the same time, in Hebrews chapter 3, perhaps we forget how the Hebrew writer is showing the superiority of Christ over Moses. And in this passage, he said, Moses was faithful in the house of God. He was a servant of God under that old dispensation, the Mosaical dispensation. 
But then it comes to verse 6. Christ is superior. Because Christ is a son who is over the house of God. Whose house are you? Whose house are we? That's what the Hebrew writer is affirming. In other words, he's showing Christ is in that house as a ruling sibling, a son of God, as we are children of God. He is a son of God who is ruling over God's house. So he's our brother. We need to think of him in that common relationship. He's the only begotten son. There's no one else a son like he is, but we have that important relationship. Is ruling over the house of God. But then in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, the Hebrew writer identifies him as the high priest between you and God. What value is a high priest? Well, a little bit of understanding about the Old Testament helps us understand the significance of the Lord in the New Testament. And that is, a high priest is a mediator. A high priest is in the middle between you and God. Why? What function does he serve? To make sure that you as a priest, every Christian is identified in the New Testament as a priest. And what is a priest? One who offers worship. And that's what we are doing this very hour, offering worship as priests in the holy priesthood of God. But we also understand that that worship would go no higher than this ceiling if it were not for a high priest who will take your worship and offer it unto God in your behalf, in the holy of holies, in heaven. Truly, he is ours. He is our high priest. Another familiar statement, the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, he's writing these things to help us avoid committing sin. But if we sin, he said, we have an advocate with the Father. Now, okay, what is that, John? Uh, well, that's Christ. That's what he is to us. He is our advocate. But what does an advocate do? Let me tell you. To put it in contemporary terms, we would all understand what it means to be in court and have a defense attorney. We're paying that guy or that gal to defend us, to present our case, to stand up for us and say what needs to be said for us before the judge. And that's what Jesus is to us. He is our advocate, our defense attorney. He is the one that stands between us and God and pleads our case, makes it possible for us to be defended, spoken for, and continually acceptable to God. If it were not for him, <laughs> it would not be possible. So he is ours. He is our mediator. Perhaps the most common that even young people and kids could probably identify from memory. Can, can you name something else that Christ is to us? Even if we're not thinking of First and Second Timothy or Titus, yeah, he is our Savior. Well, let's read the passage. 2 Timothy 1, verse 10, Paul said, But now has been manifested by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So there's no question about what Paul is telling Timothy. Timothy, Christians, Christ is ours because he is our Savior. Well, that's again something that it's easy for us to kind of take for granted, 
lightly, not as seriously as we should. And it will help if we know there's a special word for it that occurs here and in other places. Soter, Christ is our soter. Well, <laughs> we don't understand that original language, but when it's translated into a English word that we use every day, we understand it. But it doesn't just mean savior, it means deliverer. It means preserver, and it's used with reference to both God and Christ. That's from Vine's Dictionary. He defines that word and gives a lot of illumination on that word. But that's what Christ is, because he is our sotor. The apostle made this statement to Titus in the second chapter, in verse 13. He said, looking for the blessed hope, and appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, a, a light surface reading of that verse, was, oh, okay, it's kind of repetitious, isn't it? Well, maybe a, it's making the same point. But let me tell you some special things about this verse. This verse, if understood, even for just sitting down and casually reading your Bible, just picking up your Bible and reading, second uh, uh, Titus chapter 2, the second chapter, verse 13. I want to point out to you that in the original language, there are two sets of twos. There are two here and two here. Now, if you know that, then the meaning of this verse just comes out at you. All four of these things are nouns in the same case. Now, I say that to say there's a principle Granville Sharp's rule that said if in this pair there's a definite article the with reference to the first one, oh, there is the blessed hope. And if in the second pair, God and Jesus Christ, there's a the, then both of those in each pair are referring to the same thing. Do you see why that's significant? Do you see why that's important? Because what the Apostle Paul is saying, we as Christians are looking for the blessed hope and appearing. They're not two separate things. Our blessed hope, our hope that is blessed, is the appearing of the great God. They're one and the same. Not two separate things he's talking about. But let's look at the second two. The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see the point? There are those in the religious world who deny the deity of Christ. And I would admit we don't need this verse to prove that is true. But I'll tell you what, this verse adds a powerful undergirding and a clear affirmation of statement of that doctrine. What the Apostle Paul is saying to Titus, of the great God and Savior. Who is that God and Savior? Who is that Savior who is a great God? It is Jesus Christ. And what Paul is doing is simply pointing out he is deity. He's not the Father. There is God the Father, but there is also God the Son. But he is the great God himself, and he is our Savior. Let's notice some things about that. As our Savior, he is our deliverer from sin and its punishment. That in itself is enough to thrill our hearts. He is our preserver from death to raise us to life. John said in 1 John 5, 12, is the reason for this significant passage, that if we have the Son, we have the life. If we have not the Son, we do not have the life. So that's very clear, and John is making this argument for a very special reason, but it's clear to us. Jesus is our sustainer as long as we're in this world of sin and death. In this physical world, sin of sickness, sin of suffering, sin of hurt, sin of problems, sin of 
difficulties. We have to keep rising to meet the challenges of life in this physical world. And in what sense is it important that Christ is your savior? Because he is your sustainer every day. And I trust that you can say he is mine. He is mine. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, and some translations use the word sucker. That just simply means he sustains or nourishes, but it has the same meaning. One last point. Again, a very familiar statement of the Apostle Paul, but he's talking about the recognition that he has of his end. It has come. The time of my departure has come. He was in his second Roman imprisonment. He'd already stood before Caesar and been on trial in the great Roman forum already. And he knew it's over. My life is over. It is ending. And he gives some final instructions to Timothy, which Timothy is the last book that he wrote. He wrote 1 Timothy, Titus, and then 2 Timothy in that order. But he said to Timothy, henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but also to all them that love is appearing. Well, this is something a little more serious. This is something a little more sobering. I picture this as walking down a road and with a group of people, a good group of people, people that we're friends with, people that are members of our family, people that we love, people that love us. And in that group, there's Jesus walking with us in our entourage. There's something different about him. He can be your friend. He can be your brother. And he will save you but he is also ours because we must recognize him as our judge. Now what that means, Christus is used of Christ as the one who will make decisions and pass judgment to determine where you will spend eternity. That's what he is. That's why he is ours. In addition to everything else, he is our judge. As our judge, he was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. The apostle Peter preached that in the house of Cornelius, Acts 10, 42. That means whether we're living or we're resurrected, when he comes, whether he brings us out of the tomb or whether he transforms us as we stand and live and breathe on the surface of the earth, he's still going to judge us, the living and the dead. All will appear before his judgment seat to give an account. We must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ. To give answer according to the things that we have done in this body, whether good or bad. He has a judgment seat. A bench, if you will. A judge has a bench. A oma. This means a place where he will sit, a place where he will judge. And one day, just as sure as you're sitting right there, you will stand before this judgment seat. And he, while he has been yours, at that point in time, he will be yours to make a decision about you. Are you going to spend eternity in heaven or not? Some will receive a crown, according to the Apostle Paul. A crown was laid up for him and for all of them that have loved his appearing. But the rest, Jesus himself said in Matthew 25, verse 41, these are those that have been separated and were standing on the left. Depart from me. Depart from me, you cursed. Those are his words. It's quoted from this verse into the eternal fire. That's not into just a fire that is for a second or a day or a week. 
It is forever and ever. And when we come to grips with reality, we understand the seriousness of that. Christ is ours. As we have seen, we're back to where we started. From Paul's statement to Timothy and Titus. But again, I would emphasize, I hope that each one of us can affirm while he is ours as a group, as a collectivity, as his church, as members of his body, he is mine. And we have seen the Apostle Paul identify he is mine in these ways. Have you secured your part of being able to say this? We together as the church here in this place say Christ is ours. Have you secured your part in saying that? Can you say with us, with those who are here, who are members of this body of Christ in this place, your part in being able to say that? Be honest with yourself. You have, if you're serving Christ as a faithful Christian, that's what it takes, just simply to be a faithful Christian. If you haven't, then you can render the obedience today, this very hour. What makes it happen? So we stand ready to assist anyone as we think about this. I encourage and exhort all of us to think about Christ being ours, Christ being yours, and try to do your best in making it so every day of your life. But also, if it's not so, do whatever you have to do to make it so. We stand ready to assist you in obeying the gospel and being baptized into Christ as we have preparations for that to make you a child of God, a Christian, or as an erring Christian to make correction for sin that you have committed. Let us know while together we stand and sing.